All right, it looks like we've kind of evened out for people who are joining us. I'm Matt Clark, I'm from the University of Minnesota. Um, I lead the Great Breeding and Ethnology Project there. And I wanna just welcome you to our workshop today. Um, uh, focusing on what to do now that we're in Budswell. So it's a, sort of a timely webinar with some experts from the University of Minnesota and the University of Wisconsin uh, Extension with support from the Wisconsin Grape Growers Association, the Minnesota Grape Growers Association, and the Southern Minnesota Wine Growers Alliance. Um, we thank you for joining in and just um, some housekeeping things while we're getting going. If this is your first time using Zoom, the way that you can interact with us during the lecture to lectures today and the um, question and answer at the end is to use the chat feature or the Q&A box. And you can find those by hovering your mouse probably over at the bottom of your screen. It might be at the top over those features. So chat and Q&A. And so if you want to comment with the comment or ask a question, just type in there. And then um, I'll be monitoring that as we go along. So um, this webinar is being recorded and we will share the link with uh, each of you so that we can so you can uh, follow up or share it with your friends and colleagues who may have missed it for today and then we'll also contact you with a follow-up email just to let us know how you thought this went probably a, a, a quick google form um, so that we can make some improvements of what we presented and hopefully to get a better understanding of what you learned and how we can help you throughout this growing season since uh, it might be a challenge for us to meet with you face to face we're taking an approach to reach you through your computer so without further ado um, we have uh, several topics of discussion today and a little bit of transition between each of the experts and um, so we're covering, um, Christelle Godot is going to cover flea beetles and cutworms, and I told people I'm not going to pronounce her names because I'm going to say them all wrong. Annie is going to cover um, disease management in the early season, Jed will cover weed management, and Amaya will talk about fertility. And then again at the end, I'll just moderate the question and answers and let these experts answer those as we go along. So without further ado, we're going to turn it over to Christelle to get started. All right, thank you all. And I'm going to share my screen with you right now. And hopefully, um, this is going to be working. Okay, can you all see my screen? And can you all hear me? Sounds good. Okay, all right. Well, thank you everybody for joining in. Um, and uh, as you all know, we're gonna be talking about bud swell and I'll start off with uh, talking about insects. So the two main insects that we're gonna talk about for bud swell is flea beetle and cutworms. Okay, so if you're looking up here at the top gray bar, that will be your uh, grape phenology up here. And uh, as you can see, as you go through the season, really what we're gonna be focusing on are these uh, adult great flea beetle, and I'll talk more about them, and climbing cutworms. So I'm not gonna cover any of the other insects at this time, and I'll just touch on very briefly um, one slide on grape phylloxera and um, a little bit, if I have time, on um, gall uh, insects. So here are the two, uh, groups, I should say, of insects we're going to talk about um, that are uh, problematic somewhat at uh, bud swell, and there's conditions that make them more problematic than others. Um, so there's grape flea beetle that everybody should be somewhat familiar with, and then there's also cutworm uh, that are a complex of species. It's not just one species. I cannot tell you which one is the more prevalent in uh, Wisconsin, but in Minnesota, dinghy cutworm, for example, is one that is predominant. In uh, um, Michigan, uh, spotted cutworm is another one. So that those are a group of insects that are climbing cutworms, meaning that they climb up the tree branch or trunk and go uh, feed and cut the plant uh, as they're feeding. And the main reason where these two groups can be um, problematic is when you have those extended cool springs. So last year, for example, was one of those where the spring was cooler for an extended period of time. We'll see what the weather is like in the next couple of weeks here. But the longer that cooler temperature, the longer the bud is in that uh, swelling stage. And so the, the longer period of activity that those insects can inflict the damage. Because once the bud breaks, 
then uh, the shoots expand and they're not problematic anymore. Uh, they really feed on those buds that are developing. Whatever feeding happens after that is on the leaves and that's not really a problem. So a flea beetle is uh, the first one I'll talk about. Uh, it's a very small insect, so um, about a quarter of an inch long. They will emerge now in late April to mid-May and they'll feed for a couple of weeks uh, when the temperature are normal and not that extended period of time. And of course that can extend if it's colder for a longer period of time. The females will lay eggs in cluster of one to five eggs on the emerging leaves. So that's um, the next generation. There's only one generation per year. And those larvae will feed as you can see here on the leaves, but they don't really cause any damage that of a significant issue. And over winter as the new adults that emerge under the leaves, in the brush, or in the woods. So again, that's this um, adults when they're coming out of overwintering that are the most damaging because they feed on those primary and secondary buds. And what you can see in that middle picture here is that they can completely hollow out, hollow out a bud. So that can be very problematic and can decrease grape yield. And again, once that shoot grows out, not a problem anymore. It's usually uh, a localized problem, so it's uh, important to look at uh, closer to wooded habitat where they overwinter. And they're a pretty um, iridescent blue, easy, they're small, but they're somewhat easy to see, especially during warm days when they're feeding on those uh, buds. So something to, uh, to pay attention to. But what you're gonna be scouting for primarily is really the, the damaged buds. So you wanna, um, do this monitoring, you wanna scout for the damage, you wanna scout for the, the insects themselves. And there's a threshold, uh, I'll talk about that again at some point, but it's about 4%, maybe 2% of damaged buds is when you still need to have a chemical control applied. And these are some of the compounds that you can apply, uh, but I'll refer you to the uh, Midwest spray guide, and this comes from there. And so you have different uh, chemicals that you can use. Those that I, that I, I ha highlighted in green will also work for the cutworms. So something to keep in mind because you can maybe uh, tap into both of them with those compounds. Again, for the climbing cutworms, as I mentioned, it's a group of species in the uh, family Noctuidae, meaning that they're active at night. And in this case, it's not the adult that's damaging, it's the larva. So the adults don't do anything. The larva will feed extensively. They'll climb up the, tr the trunks and will feed on leaves. But what they really like to feed on are weeds. So one uh, thing to think about is the weed management that you can do around your grapevines. They're present throughout the growing season, but it's really at that stage where they're, again, you can see it down here, when they're feeding on those buds that they can hollow out uh, the, the primary and secondary buds, and that can be a problem. And this, the, the damage is very similar to the, uh, that you can see for great flea beetles. So something to keep in mind uh, that you're going to have to somewhat separate the two if you can, or use compounds that apply for both. For cutworms, the vineyards on sandy soils are more prone to injury. Um, they will, again, injure primary and secondary buds and also the young leaves. But once they expand, so when they're longer to that 10 to 15 uh, centimeter long, they're not a problem anymore. In this case, so I mentioned flea beetle, the damage occurs during the day, the adults are feeding on the buds. In this case, these are night active insects. And so you won't see them at all during the day. And what you wanna do is scout at night. You wanna go at night with a flashlight where you see those damaged buds and see if you can see caterpillars feeding on those buds. The damage will be spotty um, because a female will lay a clutch of eggs. So you might have a hot spot somewhere. And the damage threshold is at about 2% of the primary buds that are disappearing. Chemical controls, again, uh, those that were in, highlighted in green will work for cutworms that I mentioned in flea beetle, but you have others here that you can also apply. Um, there's been some work done in Washington state where people have done a pyrethroid uh, trunk sprays. Uh, where you know you have those cutworms, you can apply on the trunk um, some uh, pyrethroid, and so when the larvae are climbing up, they will pick up those residue. Again, that will not have an impact on the flea beetle because these guys are up on the branches and feeding on the buds, um, only on the, on the climbing cutworms that are going up the trunk. So if you want to contrast the two, 
Here's a table, and I'll put out an article uh, summarizing all of that in our Wisconsin Fruit News. Um, but the cutworms, as you can see on the left, um, are active at night, and it's the larvae, whereas the flea beetle, it's the adult during the day that caused the damage. The same time period for when they're a problem, but swell through bud burst. You're going to have uh, more problem in sandy soils with weedy areas for cutworms and near forested edges for flea beetle. 2% damage for cutworms, 2 to 4% um, bud damage for flea beetle. I don't have a clear number because it kind of seems to uh, vary a little bit and your tolerance level. There's not really economic uh, damage that's been done. But really what you should do is about looking at 10 buds on 10 different vines scattered throughout your, um, your vineyard and then uh, see how many out of those um, 100 buds that you looked at were uh, damaged. And then for chemical controls, again, refer to the spray guide. So I just wanted to give um, a quick thing about uh, great phylloxera. If you have, so I'm completely switching gear. If you have a problem with grape phylloxera, you might want to consider a soil application of Admire Pro for systemic control from bud swell until the leaf are expended. So that's about now too. So think about that if you have a history. We know that we can tolerate quite a bit of, of those goals that grape phylloxera will cause. Uh, but if you have a history or hot spots where you have more of that uh, right hand picture where the leaves are starting to curl up, you might need to apply um, Admire Pro or there's also some generic uh, versions of that as a soil application for systemic control. And I'll finish, this will be my uh, last slide, is uh, looking at those different type of goals that you might be seeing in the, in the future here in the next month or so. Um, in general, none of those um, uh, goal making uh, flies their gold midges or gold gnats will really cause any problem. Uh, so in general, you will not have economic problem with these. Only grape phylloxera is the one causing gold that could lead to a problem for you. And that's the spray guide I mentioned, and that's all I have, my contact information. All right, great, thanks, Christelle. Uh, if you have questions about insects, we can you can put those into the chat box or the Q and A, and then we'll come back to those uh, at the end of the other presentations. So now we're going to switch gears and switch to Annie, I believe. So, Christelle, if you hover up to the top, you yeah, should have... I was looking for it. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> Did it work? Yes. Okay. All right. So we're just going to go one after the other um, since we're doing questions at the end, like Matt said. So uh, I'm going to talk about early season disease control. And we're going to talk about fungicides again in a couple weeks at the May, was it May 13th, um, the next webinar in this series. But right now, if you haven't decided which products you're going to be applying between bud swell and bloom. Um, this is a time to get that all in order. So we're going to talk about it now. All right, so we're not quite at bud swell yet, at least in the part of Minnesota where I am. And I haven't gotten any reports from Minnesota growers saying that they're in bud swell yet. Obviously, I understand that that might be different for parts of Wisconsin. Um, but even if you're not in bud swell yet, you can still be thinking about a dormant spray if necessary. There are two diseases that a dormant spray of lime sulfur can control. One of those is anthracnose, which is shown in the upper right here, and the other one is powdery mildew in the lower right. And so if you have had a lot of problems with these diseases in the past, or if they were not controlled in the previous year, then a dormant spray of lime sulfur might be necessary to help control these. But it's not necessary in all cases. It's kind of unpleasant to apply. And uh, just because it's organic, it doesn't necessarily mean it's safe. So often I recommend, you know, think about a lime sulfur application if you really need it, but it's not something that you necessarily need to do every year. So think about the diseases that you've had in the past and whether you've had anthracnose and powdery mildew in heavy amounts. What the dormant lime sulfur spray does is it kills overwintering disease spores. Now, this isn't the only way that you can get overwintering disease spores out of your vineyard. It will also help to 
um, mow or comb those pruning cuttings out of the vineyard, get them out of there, burn them. If you have mummies laying around in the vineyard, get those out of there too. Those are all harboring disease spores. So the more you can get those out of the vineyard, the fewer you're going to have. But sulforix, uh, if you do need to spray, spray a lime sulfur product, this is calcium polysulfide. The recommended rate is one to two gallons per acre. And again, this controls anthracnose and has activity on powdery mildew as well. It's important to note that it either has poor or no activity on other diseases such as Phomopsis, black rot, downy mildew, or botrytis. So for those diseases, it's really important that you stay on your spray schedule between bud break and bloom, which we're gonna talk about next. But lime sulf or sulforix is labeled for dormant and bud swell. It can't be applied once the buds have started showing green. Um, I would just say that the last note on lime sulfur is please wear the PPE, the personal protective equipment on the label, um, just because this is a product that has um, OMRI certified organic uh, products with it, it doesn't necessarily mean it is quote safe. So it's really important to wear the PPE that the label recommends. All right, so once we get into bud break, um, we're thinking about applying things that need to be applied from one to three inch shoots. The reason we say one to three inch shoots is the bud break on your vineyard isn't going to all happen at the exact same time. It's gonna happen over the span of a few days, even within one particular variety. And so you'll end up doing your first application um, somewhere between one and three, even one and five inch shoots. Um, we don't know exactly when bud break is going to happen. It's difficult to predict this based on growing degree days, but uh, it's probably going to be sometime in mid-May for southern Minnesota based on the data range that we have. And the, here are some of the diseases that you need to uh, think about during this time. Um, black rot on the left going towards the right is Phomopsis, powdery mildew, and downy mildew. We're not controlling botrytis yet during this time period. That happens in post-bloom. So before bloom, you're thinking about applying every seven to 10 days. The first application should be at bud break. Again, that's about one to three or one to five inch shoots. So you can see what that looks like here in the middle. Most of you are probably already very familiar with this. Um, and then the next application between six and 10 inch shoots. So this is about the same time as when you need to be going out and doing shoot thinning. The third application happens in pre-bloom, which is this photo on the right. And so most people are doing about three applications before bloom. Um, I have gotten some questions about what pre-bloom actually looks like, and it can be confusing. So this photo on the left, this shows the flowers that have not opened yet. You can kind of see that tiny little opening there between those petals. Bloom is shown on the right there. You can see the stigmas have been exposed at that point. And so between those two stages, there's this little brown flower cap that falls off of the clusters. Um, one thing that people should really be thinking about at this point in time is, is your early season spray program covering all of the diseases that were just mentioned? And I, I do get people sending me their spray programs sometimes, and I do see gaps in the spray program during this time in the season. So Mancozeb, Manzate, this is a product that is really important in the early season. It's a chemistry uh, that has lower chance of uh, resistance developing, and it has broad effectiveness on anthracnose, phomopsis, black rot, and downy mildew. But it does not have effectiveness on powdery mildew. So you need to add something to your spray program to make sure that each application you're doing, you're getting powdery mildew as well. Pristine, uh, this is a very expensive product, but it has broad coverage, so that's good. But you cannot do more uh, than one spray in a row. You can't do two sequential sprays. So if you spray Pristine as your first application, you need to rotate to something else for your second. Rally, it controls anthracnose, black rot, and powdery mildew. So Rally, for instance, is something that you could combine with Makozeb to spray together, um, but then you need to rotate for something else. Captan, uh, yeah, controls anthracnose, phomopsis, and downy mildew. Um, so for instance, if you're applying Captan and Mancozeb together, um, they have double effectiveness potentially on some of these diseases, but you're still not controlling powdery mildew. All right, Sovereign and Abound. I have seen uh, somebody recommending to uh, spray one of these by themselves, but that's not going to control phomopsis. Okay, so let's say you're spraying Mancozeb and you want to find something to spray with it to control powdery mildew. Here's a few options on the left. One is JMS Stylet Oil. This is an organic product. Microthiol Disperse is also Omni OMRI certified. A few other products are Rally, Toxin, and Revis Top, as well as others. So this is a clip I took from the table in the Growing Grapes in Minnesota guide. If you've been to any of my um, seminar or conference talks, I usually pass this table out 
So this is just a, a clip of one part of it. Um, we list all the diseases up here in the, uh, the top column and then the products, there's a, a whole list of products that's on the left. And then it shows the relative efficacy of these different products. So for some of these broad spectrum fungicides that control powdery mildews, you can see they have high effectiveness on powdery mildew, but it says should be used in combination with a frac code M fungicide. Mancozeb is an example of a frac code M fungicide, for example. So um, make sure that you're following the, the guidelines in the tables and choosing products that together control all of the, those four diseases that we're talking about. All right, so this is another snap from that table, the diseases above, and you can see uh, here's some frac code M fungicides listed at the top and um, with these protectants as well. So this is a clip from Growing Groups in Minnesota. This is table 37 in this guide. Um, I use it all the time in combination with the Midwest Fruit Pest Management Guide that Christelle mentioned before. All right, so some guidelines, and we will be going over this in more detail on the, um, the webinar in May. But some guidelines, the first one is, just because we can't see diseases right now doesn't mean they're not there. At this point in the season, a lot of our disease spores, our fungal spores are starting to become active. That includes trunk disease, uh, powdery mildew, anthracnose, and others. So we can't see them making their symptoms on the plants, but they are becoming active now. And that's why we do all this control early in the season. Um, each application before bloom should address each disease that I mentioned in the slides and do consider fungicide resistance risk and rotate between applications, especially if it's specified on the label or in the table. Uh, speaking of the label, the label is the law. So um, make sure you read that before you apply. If you have questions about what can be mixed in a tank together, the label should give you some guidance on that. And five, make sure you're calibrating your sprayer at this point in the season, making sure all the nozzles are spraying evenly. Um, there's a lot of information online about how to calibrate air blast sprayers and clean out your sprayer between applications, especially if you're spraying herbicide with the same sprayer, super important. All right, so here is my information. Uh, this is my email address if you wanna get in contact with me with any questions. And I always say to reference the Midwest Fruit Pest Management Guide as well as Growing Grapes in Minnesota. Excellent. Thanks, Annie, for that quick overview um, and thorough overview. Now we're gonna turn it over to Jed and it looks like he's turned on his video and hopefully we'll take control of the screen. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Matt. Let me get my screen turned on here. Hopefully, can you all see that? Give me the thumbs up, Andy, if you can see and hear. Great, thank you very much. I can see it, but it's not in presentation mode. It will be here, it's coming. All right. so Sorry, <laughs> how about that? Great, thank you very much. For those of you that I haven't had the pleasure to meet, particularly on the Minnesota side of the river, uh, my name is Jed Cahoon and I'm a professor and extension specialist at uh, UW-Madison where I work in commercial fruit and vegetable production. Uh, today, when it comes to early season grape uh, management updates, I have a couple of items that I'd like to uh, cover in our very short time together. I uh, will spend the majority of the time talking about uh, considerations uh, for early season spring weed management. And uh, when it comes to the early season portion in particular, uh, there are a couple of pieces that I'd like you to keep in mind. The good news is there are many options. Uh, in fact, you have 29 individual active ingredients registered for uh, weed management and grapes. Now, obviously, we're not going to be able to cover all 29 of those options uh, in the next nine minutes, uh, but we'll cover some of the considerations that you might uh, think of as you choose what you're going to do uh, through the growing season. The not so good news is that uh, while you have 29 options, the grape herbicide labels are about as complicated as any of the crops that I work with. Uh, including uh, several important restrictions related to the uh, timing. And next, uh, in just the final piece, we'll talk just for a couple of minutes about uh, synthetic oxen tolerant uh, soybeans in your neighborhood, which is uh, probably the most common question that I'm getting uh, related to uh, grapes this spring. Uh, what should we be concerned about and is there anything we can do about our neighbors 
uh, using synthetic oxen herbicides near our uh, extremely sensitive grapes. So let's talk a little bit though about the considerations in choosing a weed management program. And the first thing of course that we want to uh, consider is uh, the weed control spectrum that we're dealing with. And the first three points here in particular may seem really obvious, but I would say that one of the more common uh, mistakes that I've seen in grape weed management as maybe uh, an, in, an interest in choosing the same herbicide that you used last year because you found it to be safe on the grapes. Uh, yet what happens when we do that and repeat that uh, over time with the same herbicide is that we uh, risk selecting for resistant weeds, of course, as we've seen in many areas with uh, products like Carmex or Simazine. And uh, the second risk, of course, is that we have weeds that escape uh, control. So uh, with that in mind, we need to consider whether you have annual versus perennial weeds, uh, broadleaf versus grasses, or maybe a, a nut sedge of some type. And then uh, the other piece is whether we're dealing with pre-emergent weed control or post-emergent weed control. That's extremely important uh, at this time of year uh, because a lot of the products that we're using for weed management in the early season do not have any post-emergent weed control. A great example of that would be Prowl H2O. Uh, it gives us some residual weed control, uh, but cannot uh, control weeds that are already emerged. And the next piece that we need to consider is whether we have any resistance concerns. I chose the picture on this slide very deliberately. That's water hemp, uh, a weed that I hope you haven't met before, but if you have, uh, you might as well assume that it's at least glyphosate resistant, the active ingredient in Roundup, but it's often also resistant to other modes of action like the PPO inhibitor herbicides. Those would include things like Chateau that you might use in grape or Zeus. Uh, so once we have that resistance uh, to multiple sites of action, uh, they become very difficult to control. And then what residual herbicide, if any, did you apply in the late fall uh, in dormancy uh, last year? And with that in mind, consider rotating to avoid resistance and again, to expand that weed control spectrum instead of using the same tools uh, over and over. So when it comes to our grapevines, that's where these labels get extremely uh, complicated, unfortunately. Vine age is likely the greatest constraint to herbicide use in grapes. And you'll see that across many different labels. The one with the longest extreme uh, really is Allion, a newer herbicide that reads, uh, do not apply to vines less than five years old. And then there are considerations, of course, around bearing versus non-bearing grapes. Our options are quite limited when it comes to newer plantings or non-bearing grapes. Uh, really the products like uh, Snapshot or Prowl H2O, and the options expand as we get into the bearing grapes that are more established. But the one important piece that I want to mention here that I think sometimes can be overlooked is that with several of these labels, there are steps that can be taken to lessen that vine age restriction and increase your options. A great example would be Chateau, uh, where the label says, do not apply to vines established less than two years unless they are trellised at least three feet from the ground or are protected by non-porous wraps, grow tubes, or wax containers. This is where uh, grow tubes can be important for many different reasons, not just rodent damage, uh, but also to uh, allow us to be able to expand our weed control options uh, to some that are uh, more favorable and give us a broader spectrum of weed control. I uh, like one of the most commonly used grape herbicides pre-bud break uh, Chateau. But those vine age considerations are really play probably the biggest factor in what we can use on early spring grape weed management. So then some of the other uh, considerations or some of the common options uh, that you might see in early spring pre-herbicides. Again, this list isn't exhaustive, uh, but it certainly covers some of those uh, that I see most commonly across the landscape. Uh, Casseron has been around for a while uh, and has been useful in pretty broad spectrum, uh, broadleaf and grass weed control. Uh, really with the broadleaves in particular, uh, on vines that are at least a year old. 
A chateau, as I mentioned, is unique in that it has pre-emergent activity controlling weeds before they emerge, but also some very early post-emergent activity on weeds uh, that are really, you know, half an inch or less uh, in annual broadleaves in particular. Uh, Prowl H2O is one that's been uh, quite safe on grapes and in dormant applications. It's primarily a grass killer. Uh, it does have some broadleaf weed control, but don't expect miracles. Uh, the one benefit is that it can be used on bearing and non-bearing uh, grapes. One of the newcomers, uh, relative newcomers in grape weed management is Zeus Prime XC. Uh, this is a combination of two uh, pre-mixed herbicides, one with pre-emergent weed control, the active ingredient sulfentrazone, and one in more of a burn down weed control product of very young weeds, broad leaves only, on carfentrazone. Uh, those uh, herbicides all belong to the same site of action as uh, Chateau. And again, it has some restrictions uh, about applying after bud break and the vine age. And some of those you can get around a little bit with a hooded or shielded application that protect the grape vines uh, and plants. And then we also have the classics that are still sometimes used, such as uh, Carmex, uh, watching for soil type restrictions. And again, in some areas, uh, resistance has really uh, limited the utility of some of these classics. So let's switch gears just in the last minute here and talk a little bit about the synthetic oxen uh, herbicide traits, traits that have been adopted widely uh, in the soybean seed that's uh, getting planted uh, now or shortly. Uh, looking at work by my colleagues, uh, Rodrigo Worley in the Department of Agronomy here at UW-Madison, he surveyed uh, Wisconsin soybean growers on their adoption of these traits. The one at the top of the screen, Roundup Ready 2YX, those are dicamba resistant soybeans. Dicamba is a synthetic oxen herbicide, uh, very closely related to 2,4-D. And then at the bottom, Enlist E3 acres, uh, those are soybeans that are resistant to the herbicide 2,4-D. And in this survey, if you look at the chart on the, the left-hand side of the screen, uh, you'll see that they anticipate in Wisconsin, based on his survey data, 67% of the planted soybeans uh, to have traits that confer resistance to synthetic oxen herbicides. Why is that important to a grape grower? The timing lines up perfectly when, when, with when grapes will be breaking bud. And as we know, grapes are extremely sensitive to uh, 2,4-D uh, in particular, and dicamba is a related synthetic oxen herbicide that can do an extreme amount of damage. So what can we do about it? Number one is to know about it, increase awareness as we're talking about now. The second piece though is to make your neighbors aware of the situation, the fact that you're growing grapes. Uh, the best way that I know of doing that for free in a voluntary manner is drift watch. And as you see in the map I captured yesterday, many of you are already doing that. And uh, maybe it's just important to make your neighbors know uh, that this is a system that they can look at as they're planting their soybeans and corn uh, nearby your grapes. The second piece, of course, is to know what type of damage uh, to expect from the synthetic oxens. And you can find many resources uh, online that we've all put together that will describe the type of damage uh, you might anticipate from synthetic oxen herbicides around grapes. And again, the most susceptible period is, as you see in this picture uh, that I unfortunately captured a couple of years ago, it's right after bud break and that rapid early growth uh, when these auxins or synthetic hormones uh, can disrupt that rapid growth phase uh, in grapes in very low doses. Uh, so be aware of it, communicate with your neighbors and be aware of the uh, symptomology uh, that may be caused so that you can detect it early. And with that, all of this information and the presentation that I just shared is already posted on uh, our website uh, that you're welcome to visit. And Matt and Annie, I thank you for uh, inviting the Wisconsin crowd and putting uh, this meeting together. Hey, thanks, Judd. Um, I'm gonna let you respond to a question because it popped up in minute one, I think, of our session and it has to relate to POST, P-O-A-S-T, it's an herbicide. And the yep. question is, well, um, POST damage vines. Can you respond to that one real quick while we switch over to Amaya? Sure, great. Uh, the, so the question is about post herbicide. Post is a post-emergent herbicide. 
that controls grasses only. Uh, so will it damage grapevines? The active ingredient in the herbicide post works on an enzyme that's specifically expressed in grass weeds uh, and not strongly expressed in broadleaf plants. So the active ingredient itself does not hurt grapes. The uh, particular surfactant that you include uh, in the post could if you don't follow what's listed on the post label. And that's the only time when I've seen issues, I would be speckling from the surfactant itself, uh, but not necessarily from the active ingredient. The easy way to get around that, follow the label. The post label has a very specific list of uh, surfactants that it allows and the timing in which they could be applied. And with that in mind, if you're controlling grasses post-emergence, uh, you, you, you could do that quite safely. Great, thanks for that uh, thorough answer. Um, we're sure. gonna switch gears now and uh, Amaya is going to take over. Looks like I can see your screen. So if you just wanna unmute, then you, you should be good to go. All right, uh, can you, I hope you guys can hear me and can see the screen. Annie, yes, perfect. All right, well, for those of you who uh, don't know me, my name is Amaya Tucha. I'm an assistant professor and a food crop extension specialist at the University of Wisconsin Madison. And today I want to talk a little bit about early season fertility recommendations. So, the first thing uh, that we need to uh, do to determine uh, fertility needs is to consider several factors. First of all, I would say uh, winter damage would be uh, one that we are worried about this time. Uh, and it's easy to spot last year, especially we had uh, quite a bit of damage with the solar vortex this year. The winter has been much more benign. So uh, we don't, at least here with something, we don't expect to have a lot of damage. Uh, but if you have a lot of winter damage, um, one thing to consider is that you might want to reduce a little bit your fertilization, uh, especially if you are anticipated that you're going to have a reduction in your yield. Uh, if you um, apply the same amount of fertilizer when you are expecting to have a lot of damage, what you're going to end up with is a lot of uh, new canes coming from everywhere in the corners, but also from uh, the base of the trunk and, and a lot of bigger to have to deal with. So uh, looking for winter damage or you know, seeing the signs of winter damage uh, is one of the ways that you can determine uh, whether you're going to fertilize the same as the previous year or not. The second one is previous year's yield. And ideally, you know, I would say an overall gross estimate of what you should be looking for to have or consider a normal yield would be something between four to eight tons per acre. It will depend on your training system, but it also will depend on the cultivars that you're growing and obviously the amount of damage that they have. But that is more or less something of many years of data that we've uh, recorded here in Wisconsin, what we tend to see in this cold climate break. So previous year's yield, if you have a really big uh, yield, you expect to have a lot of yield, um, you will obviously maybe bump up a little bit of that fertilizer. Um, if you are seeing that your yields are low, consistently low, that might be one indication that you might as well need to put some fertilizer, which is something that we are not very used to do with these cultivars because we always think about how vigorous they are and we're afraid of putting fertilizer. But if your yields are consistently low uh, when you don't have a lot of winter damage, uh, that might be one of the issues that you might need to support your vines with some, uh, especially nitrogen. Which brings us to vine vigor. Uh, how to assess how much vigor your vines have? Well, there's multiple things that you can do. You can look at uh, shoot growth. Um, if you have shoots that are growing, actively growing after variation, uh, that means that you have quite a bit of vigor, maybe too much. Uh, nitrogen like soil, maybe you have soils that have a lot of organic matter that are releasing a lot of nitrogen. Uh, normal bigger, those should, should stop or slow down the growth um, during variation when the fruits are changing color. That's when we expect those uh, shoots to stop growing. The other good indication of fine bigger is uh, shoot length. You need shoots between three to five feet in length. 
um, that they have at least 15 healthy leaves to be able to um, write two clusters in a shoot. So if you're having shoots that have less than that length, that is something uh, to consider. Maybe you are liking bigger and you could uh, help your vines and increase your yields by uh, fertilizing uh, at the beginning of the growing season. So I visit many, many vineyards uh, in the early, uh, right after um, the end of winter this year, looking for a site to uh, establish a study. And I saw many vineyards, sandy soils, but also vineyards that have ground cover. Uh, that they have uh, covering in the alleyway and on the vine uh, row that had short shoots, very low vigor. Those, that's a good indication that you might need some uh, fertilization there. The other, the other um, way of assessing vigor is just to look at the internal length. So the spacing between uh, one leaf and the other, if those are more than five inches, it means that you have excessive vigor. If you have the space in between the internodes is shorter than three inches, that means that you know, you maybe not have enough strength for those um, shoots to keep growing during the growing season and to provide enough uh, carbohydrates to your fruit. And obviously the most uh, important tool that we have is pathological analysis. And I've talked several times about when's the best time to collect those, that it's either uh, during bloom time or horizon. We have two windows to collect that. But if you don't have a pathological analysis, these other factors can also be considered for you to estimate whether um, you need fertilizer or not. When is the best timing to apply this fertilizer? Uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. The best time to do it is between bud break to early June. That is the window to apply these uh, nutrients. One of the reasons is, uh, especially thinking about nitrogen, that is such an important um, nutrient, a macronutrient, that uh, the highest uptake of nitrogen usually happens um, when you are around the fifth to the sixth leaf stage. That's when most of the nitrogen is being uh, uptake from the soil. Previous to that, most of the nitrogen that the vines are using is nitrogen that they are drawing from storage, from reserve, from the nitrogen that they um, have in the trunks and the root systems and in the corners from last year. In the case of potassium, most of the demand happens uh, during ripening. So you want to, if you need to fertilize with potassium, you want to do this before, way before raisin. That's why we say anywhere between bud break to uh, early July. Phosphorus is rarely a problem, but in general, if you're applying a fertilizer mix, you will have some phosphorus that is gonna go there when you fertilize it for nitrogen or for potassium. If you have sandy soil, it's really important to split these applications to avoid any uh, leaching of nutrients. And Two other nutrients that I want to talk about is boron and zinc, which are micronutrients that are needed in very small quantities, but are very important for fruit set and fruit development, berry development. Um, both of them, you want to apply them before bloom because you want the plant to have them by the time you're setting those berries. Uh, so in the case of boron, the best way to apply it is um, foliar meat. You can also do applications to the soil. Uh, but probably works really well if you if you uh, know that you have a problem with borum and you want to address it uh, this spring, you can start applying uh, borum. Uh, Solibor is one very common uh, fertilizer that you can use for soil applications and foliar leaf. And for the foliar application, start about a three-inch stage of the shoot growth. For zinc, there's um, fertilizers that can be do foliar leaf and to the soil as well. But I want to say that if you are using Mancotep, Mancotep actually has zinc. So if you're using that product for controlling disease, you're already uh, putting some uh, zinc on those vines. So as I said before, the best way to uh, determine how much fertilizer you're going to put on the need for fertilizer is to use a pethial uh, analysis. I've shown this slide before to the um, Wisconsin growers, and those are uh, shows there the uh, normal range of concentrations that you would expect to see on vines that, are, uh, that, that have been um, fertilized, so they have enough content of nitrogen, so between 0.9 and 1.3, and there's a couple of recommendations there uh, depending on your results from the pesto analysis. I want to point out that uh, there's about 3.6 pounds of nitrogen uh, per acre that is removed for each ton of grapes that you produce. 
So if you're producing about four tons of freight per acre, you're removing uh, almost 15 pounds of nitrogen. So that's more or less what you should be thinking of either replacing with fertilizer. And here's where you also need to think about the type of soil that you have. If you have a soil that has high organic matter, it might just be that your soil is naturally releasing some of that. But if you are on um, sandy soil, this uh, is a good idea of how much you should be expecting to replace uh, and put in terms of fertilization. Um, a good, you know, overall, like a very general recommendation would be anywhere between zero to 30 pounds of nitrogen per acre. I think it would be applicable for most vineyards that are bearing vineyards, that are mature vineyards. Here are some uh, recommendations for potassium as well, uh, based on, again, your patio analysis, really important piece of information to determine whether you need or not uh, potassium fertilizer. And here are some recommendations for borum and zinc. Again, as I said, these are very important. Borum is a very important nutrient for the elongation of the pollen tube to actually get fertilization and a berry that starts growing. When you see, if you happen to see a lot of your clusters that are incomplete and they're missing berries, there's two things that you want to uh, think about is how was the uh, the environmental conditions, how was the weather during bloom time? If you had really bad weather, really wet weather, that might be one problem when you're not setting enough berries. Or it can also be borrow deficiency. So looking at your uh, analysis, your path analysis is really important to address if you have a borrow deficiency. And as I said, solar bar is one of those products that you can use. It's a recommendation of how much and when to apply it, either foliarly or to the soil. And again, zinc, you can use a zinc chelate. There's many products I would recommend to look for the rates to uh, refer to the label. And for soil, soil applications of uh, zinc, zinc sulfate works well, and about 10 pounds of zinc uh, sulfate per acre should uh, be sufficient to address any deficiency. And uh, that's everything I had for today. If there's any questions afterwards, I'm happy to answer. And here's my uh, email if you want to contact me and our website if you want to look for uh, some of the information that we post there. Great. Have. Thank you, Amaya, um, for presenting on that. There are a few questions. And so um, I'm going to just start at the beginning because that's the easiest. There was a question if we're going to share the slides. Um, I don't see a reason why not at this point. I'll we'll have to figure out where those will get hosted. Today's recording will be shared, and so we'll try to find a format uh, to present the slides also. So that was one of the early questions. And then I know that Christelle responded to some of the insect-related questions in the chat box, but I don't know if, if you want to speak about those more broadly as we go. Um, one question was about Admire Pro, and if I remember, that was the systemic that was going to be applied for use in phylloxera. And Crystal, you can comment if I didn't get that right. And the question was, is that going to affect soil microbes and how long will it last? So um, Admire Pro is a systemic insecticide. It's a neonicotinoid. And so those neonicotinoids, the mode of action is um, uh, through contact and ingestion and on the acetylcholine receptors in the uh, nervous system. So they're pretty specific um, and um, I'd, it's always easy to say technically it shouldn't affect any microbes, but then we always hear about the side effects that we didn't expect, right? So as far as what the, act, the um, mode of action is, it shouldn't have any impact on the microbes as far as we know. Okay. And it's systemic, so it's long lasting <clears throat> and it should provide um, um, control for the whole season. But I've heard um, some people telling me at the, our research station using um, a generic product of that, that they still see goals forming. So it's something to keep in mind that you're not going to get 100% control. So you still have to keep track of this and be diligent in doing that maybe for a couple of years before you can back off of doing that. I would say anecdotally, we have some um some experience where we've sprayed to control for um, 
flea beetle and that actually controlled for the phylloxera. So that was a, a nice two for one that we've had here in Minnesota. And then um, Mark Hart commented um, about uh, climbing cutworms. One approach is to actually go and look for them in your sandy soil. You can root around in the top half inch or so and, and find them and you don't have to wait till nighttime to see if you have them. And then he also made a comment about another product by, by Fensrin um, that helped reduce his load of that insect pest. So I don't think there's a question there, but thanks Mark for that comment and you all should be able to re read those too. And that's the pyrethroid as I had mentioned on the trunk sprays. Oh, great, thank you. Um, then there was a question that came in in regards to, I think Annie can maybe answer this or, or others as well. Um, one of the growers had commented that they have um, pruning cut wounds that are bleeding and they want to spray lime sulfur. Are there any concerns about lime sulfur damage because of those wound sites? So um, somebody asked a similar question the other day. So I was reading the label for sulforex and it does not state any issues on the label about um, spraying open pruning wounds. Um, there is an article from Michigan State University that says if you spray open pruning wounds or any green tissue, make sure you don't spray an oil like a stylo oil within a week of doing that um, because that can cause the sulfur to go too far into the green tissue and damage it. Um, but I cannot find anything saying that spraying one to two gallons per acre of lime sulfur, which is the recommended rate, will cause um, injury on those pruning cuts. Great. There's a question for um, Jed from Kevin uh, Fowler who asked, is there a safe distance from beans, I'm assuming you mean soybeans, and then the associated sprays that are going to be used as broad, new broad leaves um, for damage to vineyard. So how far away should your grapes be, I guess is the question. Right. Thanks, Matt. I was typing a long-winded answer to uh, Kevin, so I'll try to keep my uh, oral answer much shorter. Uh, that's a great question. It's one the EPA has been asked to clarify several different times now for the dicamba products that are labeled on dicamba tolerant soybeans, as well as the 2,4-D in the Enlist system. Uh, the reality is each one of those labels varies in the requirement. Uh, and it's not as well described as any of us would like it to be. <clears throat> Excuse me, so you need to follow the label pretty strictly on what uh, they mean in terms of either listing a difference or a, a distance from uh, beans, or some of them are even less clear and they say, I do not spray if, if sensitive areas are downwind. Uh, what I can tell you is these newer products still volatilize, even though they're not uh, as volatile as the older compounds. Uh, in other states, they've been found to travel quite a long distance. Uh, so you have to follow the label, but again, that hasn't uh, saved us in all cases. All right, thank you. Um, there's a question, uh, another question about cutworms. Uh, are they known to feed on low growing fescue? That's a good question and I was starting to do a search and I seem to find just now something that may be um, showing that in general cutworms are generalist feeders. So, um, okay, I'm finding something that says black cutworm larvae grow well on creeping bent grass, perennial ryegrass and tall fescue. So they're generalists. So I would suspect yes. And one thing I forgot to mention is that the weed um, keeping the weed pressure down is going to help because they tend to feed on those weeds. So if you don't have weeds, that's also a hiding place for them. So controlling your weeds is going to help. And so I would suspect that fescue is one of those that they'll, they'll feed on. Great. So uh, there was a follow-up question about spraying just in general um, on cut areas of those vines. So I think the, the answer that I would give, uh, is there a concern about herbicides on those cut surfaces, is that you should not be spraying your herbicides up onto your grapevines. So well-targeted sprays towards the, the vineyard soil floor and towards those weeds is the best place to get them, um, to have the best desired effect without losing your product. And in general, I don't think you need to be so concerned about those openings that are, that are on the plants, but I'm open to hear what the other people <laughs> on this panel would say about that. I agree with that, Matt. Um, there's a question, can you combine uh, Mankenazab and Rally or should they be separate applications? 
Um, Mancazab and Rally is a common application for the early season. Yep. Great. Thank you. Um, I wrote down a question. I think this is for Jed. This is for myself before we before I go to the other panel. Um, one of the comments you made is that uh, age of vines is important for choosing which uh, herbicides you're going to spray. And I guess for me, we have a lot of people who are retraining trunks um, and they want to retain some suckers perhaps to combat winter injury and grapevine trunk disorders. So we're, we have lots of vineyards that have multiple ages of trunks. So you should really consider the youngest of those, I assume. Yes, that's exactly right. Uh, the youngest uh, being the most susceptible, of course. Uh, and if you're looking to retrain younger uh, vines, that would be the, the greatest challenge uh, with the vine age restriction. Okay, thanks for clarifying that for me. Um, there's a great question. How do you lower your potassium and phosphorus if it's too high on your soil test, uh, according to, your, to the soil test? Maybe Amaya wants to answer that one. And there was a little bit of concern. If you can get closer to your microphone, that would be great. Sure. Uh, there's nothing that you can do actually about it. Uh, you just avoid any type of fertilization with nitrogen and with phosphorus and eventually, uh, sorry, with uh, what is potassium and uh, phosphorus. And eventually the vines are just going to consume a lot of it. Uh, but there's nothing that you can do. You can't, you can't take it out of the soil. Uh, and that's certainly true in a lot of vineyards that have been established on areas where they used to be either row crops or they're close to your know, areas that were heavily fertilized with manure. And so that's one of the issues that, that, that we see here. So selecting maybe if you're going to use fertilizer, making sure that you have fertilizers that in the mix have low concentrations of phosphorus and potassium. Out. I, I, I did if, Am I, if you're done? Yeah, you're the one answer? whose internet went out. She's, she's good. Okay. <laughs> okay. Excellent. Sorry about that. I, all of a sudden, everything froze. Um, let's see. So there was another question about, um, I think, Asian beetles or Japanese beetles. I'm trying to scroll up. I lost track. Yeah, it's Asian beetle. And I tried to answer that, but it's probably Japanese beetle that you mentioned, Andy, and um, it, this will be the topic of another entire session, I think. Um, it's a major problem. It's the number one pest in grapes, and so it's not easy to enter like that. Neem oil is one that has not been proven to be extremely effective, and like you said, you have to reapply. It's a repellent, um, but the, the trials I've seen are not great. Uh, and the main problem with Japanese beetle is that you end up having more move in. Um, so a repellent is a better option. One that people have used if you want to stay organic and has to be reapplied is kaolin clay. So that might be something you want to try because that's pretty effective. And I've seen good trials on that, but you have to reapply often. It might not be what you want to do when you're close to your winery because it doesn't look so great, <laughs> just as a comment. Uh, if you're taking your wedding pictures there, maybe don't do, it, do that. Um, there was a question about keeping weeds down at this point in the season for folks who are organic. Are there um, organic options other than mowing and hoeing? Uh, no, unfortunately, at uh, Christmas in July, ho, ho, ho is the number one option. <laughs> but... Uh, other than mowing, no, cultivation has been uh, rather detrimental in a lot of cases with uh, shallowly rooted vines and such. Um, so really it's, it comes down to uh, a lot of mowing, uh, some hoeing, and generally a lot more tolerance of weeds uh, than in other systems. Um, there was another question, I think it was still in reference to pruning wounds and just thinking about what about cuts from weakened trunks that were removed. So I think people are just concerned about having big open wounds. What about herbicides getting into those? Um, Jed, do you want to comment on that yeah, too? That, that would be a concern on an open wound, of course. Uh, you know, we actually have herbicide labels to remove plants by doing that in what we call a cut stump treatment. Uh, and this would be similar to that where, uh, yes, one would expect a lot of damage on an open surface uh, that can uptake uh, soil or a water solution with herbicides. Great, thank you. Um, there was another question 
um, we often hear about sprays that other farmers apply that impact grapes. Does that go the other direction? I saw maybe their question is, uh, is there something that a vineyard would be responsible for spraying that might impact uh, another grower or farmer nearby? I'll speak to it from the herbicide standpoint. Uh, most of the herbicides that are commonly used in grapes uh, are not prone to much off-site movement in terms of volatility, conversion from the uh, liquid form typically that they're applied in to a gaseous form. Uh, so they are not as prone to travel uh, long distances as some of the compounds that I mentioned earlier. Let me put it this way, in over 20 years of doing this, I've never investigated a drift from grapes to another <laughs> crop. <laughs> it's always been the other way around. And I laugh in, uh, <laughs> in irony, not in uh, jest. Yeah, I, something that people should remember, at least in our experience and kind of our, um, our research centers in a, a peri-urban environment is that turf grass is one of the um, number one acreage of plants across this country and broadleaf herbicides like 2,4-D and dicamba are used in those situations. And so there's certainly drift coming from products applied in those areas too. So it's not just um, rural agricultural systems, the urban ones also can impact grape growers. I would say that from the standpoint of acreage, we have such smaller acreage in grapes than we do other crops like corn or soybean or things like that, that it's less likely but that you always have to be very careful when you apply something that you prevent drift. So not spraying obviously when it's windy and taking all the precautions is very important because there is the possibility. And Craig, I noticed that was your question. And that's something that I don't know if you would be responsible, but I would suspect that yes, if there was a problem and that could be traced back to you, there could be some liability there that like there is in any case uh, like that. But the likelihood, like Jed said, is I've never heard of anything like that. And I don't think hopefully that we'll hear that. Okay, I think we have time um, just to re review one more comment. And then Annie, if she wants to try uh, some poll questions that hopefully you all in the audience are willing to respond to. But the question was, is pH of a 7.12 high for Itasca? Actually, that's probably a good question for any of the grapevine varieties we're interested in growing. Um, and the Maya, I don't know if you want to answer that live, but I can read what you wrote. Um, pH of 7.1 should be fine, just to make sure that you're monitoring your plants over time and also your soil over time to make sure that the pH doesn't continue to increase and that the use of um, fertilizers that acidify the soil like ammonium sulfate are a good way to keep pH low. So I don't know if you have more to say, Amaya. Uh yeah, that's just fine. I just say like for, for that, I mean, the, the ideal range is 6.5 to 7. Uh, so 7.1 is just not worth it to do any major, you know, pre-planting pre uh, amendment or applying sulfur. I think that just um, choosing fertilizers that tend to be, as I said, more acidifying, like uh, anything that has, you know, sulfate uh, could... Uh, just do the trick, and but keep an eye on it so that you make sure that they're not increasing as, as the years go by and you potentially have a, a um, nutrient problem because of that. Awesome, thank you. One last question, I think Jed, this is for you. Can 2,4-D be used during dormancy? And so I'm guessing that's for a grape grower who wants to get some broadleaf weeds out of their vineyard. I sure, I get asked that question quite often, and uh, the answer is no, I would stay away from that as far as you can. The risk is just too great. Uh, and uh, the one thing to keep in mind is 2,4-D applied now could be around later when we do get warmer temperatures uh, and volatilize at that date. And uh, very small amounts go a long way, unfortunately. Great, thank you. That's gonna be our last question from the audience, but Annie just implemented uh, a poll. So hopefully that popped up on your screen and you can answer some questions. That would be great. Yes, you... thank you. Answering questions like this helps us know whether or not we should put on more of these and uh, helps our bosses understand the importance of what we do as well. So thank you. While you're doing that, I'm just going to, if I can share my screen at the same time. Do you know if that's possible? Go for it. I don't want to mess oh, it yes. up too much. Oh. <laughs> Is there, can you still see the poll? 
Yeah. I just I just wanted to put up the announcement for the next series is on this flyer, so you can take a look at that while you're answering the poll. Yep, the next one's May 13th. Um, we'll be going more into fungicides, and then John Toole will also be joining us for that one, talking about um, methods for planting grapevines and caring for vines right after you plant them. So um, that'll be great to get his expertise in here too. Um, and then we've, you know, it's it's possible that we could uh, plan more of these later in the season. So that's one of the reasons we're asking that question number one, would you like any more of these webinars later in the season? So thanks everybody for filling that out. Everyone said yes. <laughs> <laughs> All Great. Right. Um, so I'm going to stop my share. I've got a split to get to my next meeting. Um, but if you guys want to stick around and wrap up, that'd be great. All right. Thanks, Thanks everybody. See you guys. Thanks, Matt. All right. Um, Christelle, did you want to, did you set up a separate Google or a separate Zoom link for us to chat? Yes, I did. Oh, so everybody's okay. gone. There's still 61 people here. Yep. Okay. Well, is if there any other questions that people have? Um, Kevin wanted to know how my bread turned out. It turned out great. Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> okay. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Stay safe and healthy.